Yeah, thank you very much um, uh, to the organizers. It's, this is a wonderful opportunity to be able to, to have a sparse matrix days, uh, just to be able under these extreme circumstances. So today, um, I want to tell you a bit about uh, some work that uh, myself and my colleagues have been doing in uh, spectral uh, clustering of graphs. I mean, in the area for sparse matrices, uh, this is uh, ideas that have been used uh, going back over 30 years. Uh, back in, uh, I guess, 1990, there was a, the, um, the, the report uh, by a um, paper by Alex Poth and Horst Simon and Kang Pu uh, Lu, who had uh, used the Fiedler vector for reordering of sparse matrices. So it's a long history here, and uh, to kind of walk through a little bit and uh, some of the applications. So about six years ago, some colleagues of mine at uh, Johns Hopkins, Carrie Preeb and others, Joshua Vogelstein, uh, as a neuroscientist, uh, um, no, I like data, um, particular sparse matrices. Uh, so they gave me uh, 42 brains, or at least models of brains. And these are called uh, connectomes. This is a, a coarse model of a human brain. Human brain, of course, has uh, hundreds of billions of neurons. Uh, this uh, matrix or graph uh, model of it uh, has about 800,000 uh, uh, vertices. And so the connections, these are voxels, a uh, little thing of little uh, cutting the brain up, uh, partitioning the brain up into little cubes spatially. And then if there's uh, there's an edge between the, the two cubes, if there's believed to be some association or some, some connection pattern. Okay, so on the right, what you see is a reordering of that matrix. And uh, this is the, the ground truth. If you squint, you can see a, a little bit of a uh, a large, I'm going to focus on the, the uh, larger patterns and that there's a, um, what you're seeing is the left and right hemispheres uh, of the brain, that there's uh, sparser connections between them. You'll see some bordering patterns around the edge, uh, those are your keen eyes, and we can talk about that in a, in a little bit. Okay, so to actually talk more uh, technically about uh, uh, how these spectral methods are to be able to work and be able to prove theorems and to be able to analyze them, it's good to have a model always, right? So um, a, a simple graph uh, model that uh, works well, um, uh, at least teases out a lot of information about uh, uh, these graphs as a stochastic block model. And so that's a very simple idea. Many of you are familiar with the area of Schrani, and you probably even know the, the stochastic block model. But it's a generalization of the Erdos-Schrani model, and we have basically have little patches within the graph of uh, different high, uh, different levels of connectivity. Um, and so, formally, just as we have the partitioning here, I have it as a, written as a bipartite graph. Uh, but some of the graphs, yeah, you know, so later will be bipartites I mean, that way. Um, and then, from a uh, probabilistic model, you can think of the entries, the non-zeros, uh, they're normally trials, where there's an edge between them, and there's, you can see it's an inner product of uh, two matrices and it's a scaling factor for sparsity for technical reasons. Okay, so it turns out that you can prove a theorem under this case, so you have this, uh, this stochastic block model, and there's several uh, spectral methods we can use to take a graph and uh, embed it. The most natural is just taking the adjacency matrix, doing a um, partial a truncated uh, eigen decomposition, uh, if you will, it's basically a singular value decomposition. We're going to write it as eigenvalues and we'll be taking uh, absolute value appropriately. So we're going to go to dominant uh, eigenvalues uh, and eigenvectors, and we'll be looking at, say, rank D approximations of them. And illustrated here is a rank two, a sort of a, a two-dimensional embedding for each of the vertices. We have a, a point. And likewise, we could do other, other uh, scalings of the graph. And another a natural one is one that comes out of the normalized Laplacian. Uh, this is sometimes called a reduced adjacency matrix. Um, and technically speaking, there's a shift involved for the normalized Laplacian, but we'll, just, we'll call that the normalized Laplacian. And again, you'll take the, the spectral decomposition and do a similar uh, approach. And so um, asserting here is that the spectral embedding uh, can recover these. And so uh, specifically, what there, there's uh, two main theorems. Q 
obscure that which say that the adjacency spectral embedding, which is the first of these, and then the normalized Laplacian are able to recover the parameters of the stochastic block model um, in the uh, parlance of uh, statistics are called universally consistent and, and, and limit to get enough data, edges, uh, samples of edges from the graph, you're able to get these parameters. And that's spelled out in the, the series of a number of papers here. Uh, so it's natural to say, okay, well, both of these uh, spectral methods uh, recover the parameters of stochastic block model. Uh, if we apply it to our brain data, this is the brain now displayed out and, and with a partitioning, a spectral partitioning. This one, I believe I was using some code that John Gilbert uh, uh, and his colleagues had put together. And so this is using the JCC spectral. And the time I did this, about six years ago, it was believed that if you ask for a bi uh, uh, just a bisection of the brain, no matter what the spectral order, you would get a left hemisphere and right hemisphere. And I did the, the, the 42 or so brains and generally not, occasionally it was. So, you know, I was, went to Hopkins and spoke to my colleagues, Joshua Vogelstein, who's a neuroscientist, suggested cutting the, um, dissecting the, um, the image. And so I you know, figured out how to do that. And so for Joshua, I um, mean, John Tukey, of course, has let the data speak to you. And this uh, sometimes, things shout to out at you in, in data. In this particular case, this was not a left hemisphere, right hemisphere partitioning. It was something else. And for Joshua, it whispered um, actually something different of the, of the brain of the uh, gray matter and white matter of the brain. So here we have uh, the brain partitioned into five regions. The border region is the, the, the noisy region, the skull, which comes out, uh, which is still in the imaging. We can, we're going to remove that. And so we'll have just uh, four main partitions, left, right, and then gray matter and white matter. And so we'll, and a, as a statistical model, we'll put that in as, a, again, as a, you know, a four by four uh, stochastic block model, which uh, representing each of these. So you can see the very sparse areas here, which is uh, the gray matter regions of the brain. And then we're seeing um, another pattern of uh, dense connections, and which are are the gray matters in the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Okay, so there's more than one partition that could be done. And so the, the question is, if you apply different uh, spectral method, which which partition will you arrive? Well, it turned out that uh, so after about uh, five or so years uh, thinking about this with uh, a number of, uh, number of folks, we're able to prove that in the case of the adjacency spectral embedding, it's going to tend to find the gray matter, white matter partitioning if you ask for a bisection. And likewise, with the normalized Laplacian, it's going to do that hemispheric uh, partitioning. And this formalizes it on the right is the actual um, uh, 42 brains. Um, and uh, on the left is the stochastic block model and the and the the measure of agreement with the partitioning is the adjusted RAND index, which is a uh, measure of an agreement which uh, accounts for what you would expect at random. Um, okay, so I guess moving on to uh, the second application. Uh, this is uh, one that comes out of a computer, a computer network. So what we're seeing here, this is a, a spy matrix, a spy graph of a, a sparse matrix. Uh, the rows are the server computers, and the columns are accesses of people logging onto a server. Uh, maybe typically, you know, you, maybe you're going to the mail server, you're know, using your favorite mail app, a Linux machine or a uh, Unix machine. And uh, our colleagues at Los Alamos put the, have uh, great data sets, and one of the data sets they had, uh, they actually have an intrusion event where people are maliciously trying to um, uh, log in to uh, servers or not to have authority for. Um, so the goal is to be able to find these events within the, the other events and just looking at it in a graph model. And so if we look at it as a stochastic block model, uh, the red team event where they're trying to surreptitiously log into the servers, it turned out that there are, that we're seeing the dark region there, that area of the graph uh, connection, they're 
coming from clients, which tended to be more active than usual, and also servers, which were more popular. So they're attacking the most popular servers. Um, and what you're seeing here is a core periphery uh, stochastic block model of the graph. And you know, if the theory were to apply from what we saw in the neuroscience application you know, about stochastic block models, that perhaps the adjacency spectral embedding might be a preferred thing to do if you want to actually get a little bit more information about these intrusion events. Um, so let's look at it as, instead of the clustering problem as a graph classification. So here we'll allow ourselves to have a subset of the attacks and say, well, what other computers are they going to attack? We give ourselves half of the computers uh, that they were attacking. So we'll play the game of using the spectrum things as a feature set, and then uh, train a classifier on the on the uh, on the on the training data, and then try to predict on the on the held back uh, the computers, which were uh, not whether to classify whether a computer uh, server will be attacked or not attacked. So here's the summary of that those results. So we're going to focus just first at the um, broad level of the the colors, uh, you know, the, the blue region uh, is that, uh, where we use the adjacency spectral embedding. And those numbers tend to be higher, which is again, following through that we have this core periphery um, model that it's, you would expect higher. And so we have false positive rate, true positive rate. And this is the area under the curve if you plot the area. And that's sort of a thought to be the best measure in terms of a low yield uh, classification problem. Um, the second effect is that we're using a uh, more than one uh, eigensolver uh, as a randomized SVD. There was a problem in the, uh, the earlier versions of um, uh, in Python with randomized SVD, and, and so that's why it's lagging behind the block line shows here. I have slides later, which will be distributed, which, uh, in, uh, which goes into that. Okay, so. Our uh, third application uh, is uh, having to do with uh, natural language processing uh, in the area of machine learning. And uh, many of you may have heard of uh, methods which uh, would take words and associate them with uh, uh, points in, uh, in Euclidean space. Um, one of the most popular methods is called word to vec uh, about a handful of years ago, uh, Chris Manning, who was at um, Stanford, referred to them as a sriracha sauce of deep learning. And it just, and some folks said, you add it to anything, it makes it better. Um, so here's a little bit about linear algebra associated with uh, one of a related word embedding. Uh, and under the hood, there's co occurrence matrices. This is a, uh, the rows are words. And then we have the columns also are what we refer to as, as context. And you're seeing a left context and a right context. So it's a uh, non-zero of uh, the word occurred before or after uh, the word and how many times the word. So we actually have counts instead of just uh, non-zeros. Of course, uh, one approach is naturally to do linear algebra on these. Uh, there's something called eigenwords uh, and variations therein, which is uh, grows, actually builds on the theory of canonical correlation analysis. Um, and under the hood, you look at it, it's normalized Laplacian, and it comes back with these clusters. And again, you know, it, it fits in with the, the theory that we, what, uh, as our understanding that you, what you're looking, when you're looking for uh, partitioning of words into clusters or related words, that a normalized Laplacian is, is the right measure. Other applications with uh, Diana Leary and text summarization, we've used uh, uh, spectral decompositions of matrices, just just the adjacency matrix. And there, in summarization, if you're looking for the main topics, that is uh, the more appropriate uh, uh, partition, uh, the spectral uh, method that perhaps you use. Okay, I, and uh, at that point, I'll take any questions if we have them. Thank you, John. There's one question here in the chat. Uh, okay. Do you start from diffusion tensor MRI data, or is this an earlier step in the data processing? Ah, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. It, it is. It's yeah. It is the uh, uh, the diffusion 
uh, data. So we actually, what we have are just, uh, we're, we have, I, I'm just working with the graphs themselves. So it's just the connection patterns at all. I'm not, uh, you know, the, there, there's been a lot of image processing work done ahead of time, which uh, traces it out. And there's, uh, um, yeah, we wanted uh, early on, as I, John, as I mentioned John Gilbert, John and I went up to Hopkins and spoke to them about some more of what's under the hood. And they wanted to very much keep us away from what was going behind the curtain because this was largely a step along the way because eventually they want to get towards these um, 100 billion uh, node graphs and, and the technology would be a little bit different and how they actually be doing it. So some of the, so there's actually uh, clique graphs that are going on here under the hood, which uh, we were anxious to get at, but our, our hands were slapped <laughs> about to look at those. But yeah. thank, thank you for that. And there is a question from John Gilbert. Do you think adjacent and Laplacian are just two of many different possible methods that could all give different truths in some cases? Yes, actually, uh, thank you, John, for that question. Uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, actually uh, some recently we've been doing some work actually in non-negative matrix factorization and playing with um, uh, very, everything from pointwise mutual information and uh, and uh, you know yeah. So I, I think it is the case that you can tease different things out, and that we're seeing in the non-negative equivalent that there's there are situations which uh, more than two approaches, you know, so I, I think there is, of course, the linear ones are the most, are the easiest to analyze, but yes, but yeah. 